Listener, Obscura is supported by people like you. So head over to patreon.com slash Obscura Crime Podcast to get access to bonus episodes, bonus content, and even merch. You get access to a massive backlog of bonus episodes, hours and hours of Obscura content not released to the main feed. That's patreon.com slash Obscura Crime Podcast. Thank you. Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. Take a seat. Next to the fire. Welcome to Obscura, where we shine a light on the dark. archives of the Charlie Project, which profiles over 15,000 cold case missing people, mainly from the United States. Patricia Elaine Action, age 25 years old, height and weight, 5'4", 96 pounds, missing since 5 1978 Caucasian female, brown hair, blue eyes, Action has a scar on her abdomen, Her nicknames are Patsy and Patty, and she may use her married name, Woodyard. Her blood is type O. Action was last seen leaving the Ramada Inn on US-19 North and State Route 60 in Clearwater at 11.30 p.m. on May 26, 1978. She had moved in with her parents six weeks before her disappearance. After she filed for divorce and was forced to drop out of Stetson University, Due to an illness, she had recently taken a job at the Kapok Tree Inn. She had just gotten her paycheck and had gone out to the Ramada Inn Lounge that night after work to celebrate with friends. After about a half an hour in the lounge, during which time she had half a drink, Action said she was going to the bathroom and would return in a few minutes. She took her purse with her. The employees didn't notice anything amiss at the time. Action never returned to her friends, never came home, and has never been heard from again. Her parents stated they did not attempt to control her life, but she was always good about keeping them informed, where she was and what she was doing. Her parents reported her missing the day after she was last seen. Four days after Action's disappearance, her car, a white two-door 1969 Chevrolet Malibu, turned up abandoned on US-19 in Tarpon Springs, Florida. She had been raised in that city and graduated from Tarpon Springs High School. Her purse was not inside the vehicle when it was found. A substantial amount of typo blood was splattered inside the vehicle. On the front seat, floorboard, and keys, there was enough blood to indicate someone had sustained a severe, possibly fatal injury. Authorities couldn't determine whether it was Action's blood. Although it was her type, her shoes were also inside the car but there was no indication of her whereabouts at the scene. Action is considered to be missing under suspicious circumstances, and foul play is suspected in her case, which remains unsolved. From the pages of the August 13, 1978 Pinellas Times, title, Body Identified as Missing Teen, Clearwater Police have confirmed that the skeletal remains of a body found in a wooded area of Clearwater on August 2nd, are those of 15-year-old Deborah Rizzo, missing since July 24th. Captain Al Valucci said Friday that identification was made comparing some x-rays of Miss Rizzo, sent from a hospital in Connecticut, to the skeletal remains. Dr. Robert Hoffman, chief radiologist at Bayfront Medical Center, made the final confirmation after studying the x-rays. Miss Rizzo lived at 2174 Belcher Drive, about a quarter of a mile from where the body was found. Deborah was diagnosed as a schizophrenic two years prior to her death, 
The family moved to Clearwater in April. Captain Volucci said the death is being investigated as a homicide. From the pages of the September 1st, 1980 St. Petersburg Times. Title, 19-Year-Old Clerk Disappears from Convenience Store. A 19-year-old convenience store clerk vanished from her job before dawn Monday and was still missing by late evening. After a day-long search, authorities said they were unsure whether the woman, Cynthia Clements of Pinellas Park, left voluntarily or was abducted. Miss Clements was last seen about 4.30 a.m. inside the Lil' General store at 6185 54th Ave in Kenneth City, where she had just taken a job as a night clerk. A St. Petersburg time delivery man dropped off a load of newspapers and spoke with her briefly. The delivery man said later that nothing appeared unusual, but an hour later, when a customer walked into the store, Miss Clements was gone. The doors were unlocked, a radio was playing, and her purse was still behind the counter. The customer flagged down a passing Pinellas County Sheriff's deputy touching off the search. During the morning, deputies with dogs combed woods to the north and west of the store, and others scanned the area from a helicopter. Crime technicians lifted fingerprints from inside the store. Detective Sergeant John Mulry called Miss Clement's disappearance highly suspicious and expressed a concern for her safety, but he cautioned that, We do not have the evidence to actually support foul play. Apparently, no money was taken from the store, and there were no signs of a struggle. A sheriff's spokesman said, Miss Clement started working at Lil' General less than a week ago. On the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, her father, 44-year-old John Clements, said Monday afternoon that he had worried about his daughter taking the job. Clements talked with the store manager about it. He recalled that she said it was a good neighborhood. She told me, don't worry about her, but a job like that, it's just no place for a young girl, I guess, said Clements, a maintenance worker for the city of Pinellas Park. Despondent, Clements and his wife Nancy sat in the shade of a spreading Florida holly tree Monday afternoon and waited for some word of their daughter's whereabouts. None came. Monday evening, her voice about to crack, Mrs. Clements said, As time goes by, I just get more scared. She and her husband fear that, in her words, something happened. She wasn't ever involved in any drugs, any alcohol, any misfits, he said. That's why we know something bad happened, because we know her. The Clements feel certain that Cynthia, a devout Baptist, did not simply leave her job. She does not have a car, and she knows virtually no one in the area because the family moved here from Birmingham, Alabama just a month ago. The stunning disappearance of their daughter came as the Clements were, quote, just getting on our feet, Mrs. Clements said. The family decided to move to Pinellas County after vacationing here in June. They wanted to be closer to Mrs. Clements' parents in North Central Florida. They were attracted by the beaches, the climate, and the promise of a good job for Clements, who was trained as a tractor-trailer mechanic. Follow up to the previous article from the St. Petersburg Times. Title, Records Confirm Dead Girl's Identity. A medical examiner using dental records confirmed Friday that the young woman's body found earlier this week was that of Cynthia Clements, a 19-year-old convenience store clerk who had been missing since September 1st. The records had been sent from Alabama, where the victim lived for most of her life before moving recently to Pinellas Park with her family. Miss Clements' skeletal remains were found Tuesday, and the sheriff's department announced a day later that the victim had been strangled. So far, detectives have declined to say whether there was any solid clues in the woman's disappearance and death. They buried Clements Monday, but the mystery of her disappearance and death lives on. A silver rose casket with gold handles and ceramic violets went into the earth, 12 blocks from the Little General store, from which she disappeared. And while Pinellas County Sheriff's detectives stood behind trees watching for her killer, a young Baptist preacher prayed for the quiet 19-year-old woman and the stunned survivors she has left behind. Nancy Clements wiped a tear from her cheek with a pink carnation from the floral spray atop her daughter's casket. She and her husband, John, shook with seven weeks of hell 
as they endured the short funeral and graveside service. Cynthia was the oldest of their three children. She vanished on her third night as a convenience store clerk. Her strangled body was found in a mid-Pinellas wooded area one week ago of five women missing suspiciously from the Tampa Bay area since last November. Cynthia is the only one who has been found. Born on September 18, 1940, James Delano Winkles was raised in rural Alabama in the 1940s. His mother died shortly after he was born from childbirth complications, and he was raised primarily by his paternal grandmother and a couple of aunts. Lena and Irene, James' grandmother and aunt, were convicted of bootlegging and sentenced to federal prison in West Virginia. They were released early to care for James, after his mother died and his father had no interest in caring for him. James Winkle's uncle, J.C., could see in hindsight that Lena Wade was not a good mother. There was no sexual morals in the home. There was no discipline. And education was not a priority. The children were encouraged to break the law, such as stealing coal from the railroads in order to heat the house in the winter. According to J.C., Lena Wade was not trying to turn her children into major criminals but the stealing was a matter of survival. She raised six children alongside James. J.C. recalled an incident where Lena Wade and other relatives were teasing James about his small penis. But according to J.C., she didn't mean any harm by it. James did not complete the ninth grade and started getting into trouble for such things as stealing cars around that time. And according to Winkles himself, his entire family was, quote, oversexed. What that translates is to this. James Winkles was sexually abused and raped by his grandmother and two aunts from the time he was about nine years old until he was 32 or 33. Yes, these women, who were family members, sexually abused him from a young age and then groomed him to continue the activity until he was in his 30s. The women of the house walked around in various stages of undress and gave him baths all the time. They walked around in their underwear, something that would stick in James Winkle's mind. Lena would frequently take him into her bed and warmed his hands between her breasts. Each incident seemed to escalate further until one evening James's grandmother taught him to perform oral sex on her when he was about seven or nine years old. James's family had money, but according to him, refused to spend it on him. His grandmother and aunts ate steaks and pork chops, but they'd give him hot dogs. They wore fine clothes, but he only had rags. According to James, he did not feel that his family had any affection for him. He was an outsider, and they did not express any love outside of the sexual abuse in the bedroom. There was incidents where his grandmother would hold his hand over the kitchen sink, and they'd use a butcher knife to cut his hand and after giving him this lesson, they'd take him into the bedroom where he was raped. From the archives of the Charlie Project, Leanne Colleen Huffman, age 29 years old, height and weight, 5'6", 130 pounds, missing since 6-5-1978, Caucasian female, blonde hair, hazel eyes, Huffman has a scar on her left knee, she may go by her middle name, Colleen, or use the last names Collins or Jalipsy. Huffman was last seen in Tampa, Florida. On June 5, 1978, she has never been heard from again. Her vehicle was found parked at a Holiday Inn in Tampa three days after her disappearance. Few details are available in her case. From the pages of the September 11, 1980 issue of the Tampa Bay Times. Title Woman missing without a trace. On her second day of work, driving a mobile animal grooming unit for Pampered Poodles Pet Salon. On a Tuesday, 19-year-old Elizabeth Graham disappeared without a trace. The van she was driving was found Wednesday at the address of her last appointment, but the house at 2125 Bradford Street in the High Point area outside Largo 
has been vacant for six months. Miss Graham is the second 19-year-old woman to have disappeared in recent days. A St. Petersburg convenience store clerk disappeared two weeks ago, leaving the store where she worked unlocked, and she has not yet been found. Miss Graham had finished six weeks of training at the Pampered Poodles Pet Salon in St. Pete. She had started driving for their mobile service Monday and was in a white van with, quote, Pampered Poodles Mobile Salon, lettered in pink on the sides. Her stop at the Bradford Street address had been arranged by a man who called the shop for an appointment. Sheriff spokesman Merrill Stebbins said, Stebbins did not release the name the man gave, saying it may have been fictitious. The van was found by Pinellas County Sheriff's detectives parked in the driveway at the Bradford Street address. It had a flat right front tire. There was no signs of Miss Graham and no signs of a struggle. A real estate's firm for sale sign hangs from a post in front of the yard of the house on Bradford Street, a dusty, unpaved, one-block-long street off Roosevelt Avenue, a few blocks east of US-19. Detectives searched the area. Using both a police dog and a helicopter, they found nothing. The owner of the house and a person from the real estate firm that has it listed for sale came with keys. Detectives searched the house to no avail. When Miss Graham did not return home Tuesday night, her boyfriend, Gary Muchmore, became concerned, as did his mother, Maureen Turner. All three lived together in a duplex. This isn't like her. Liz is very responsible, Miss Turner said Wednesday as she and her son, who both appeared to have been crying, talked to detectives and reporters at Bradford Street. She's a beautiful girl, a gorgeous girl. She's five foot six, about 110 pounds. Long brown hair, hazel eyes. She looks like a model. My lord, I hope they find her. I sure do. And that she's all right. Much more said that when he got home Tuesday night, about midnight, he was surprised that his girlfriend wasn't there. By 2.30 a.m. Wednesday, he was worried. At 8 a.m., he was standing outside the Pampered Poodle's office on 31st Street, waiting for it to open so he could find out if employees there might know where Miss Graham was. They didn't, but they called the sheriff's department and furnished detectives with a list of addresses where the young woman was going to go to groom the animals Tuesday. Empty van, empty house, no Liz, much more commented. He had arrived at the Bradford Street house shortly after detectives. He said he found in the van only a smock that she put on before washing an animal. She wouldn't have jeopardized her job. She loves animals. Much more as a lead singer with the band Snowblind. He and his mother have known Miss Graham for four years. From the pages of the October 9th, 1981 issue of the Tampa Bay Times. Title, Woman's Car Found at Work. No sign of her found. Margot Delamont apparently drove her 1973 Oldsmobile onto the parking lot of the Pinellas Park firm where she worked Saturday morning and has not been seen since. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Department is searching for the 39-year-old Clearwater woman whose disappearance seemed to follow the same pattern as that of several other females in the county. Mrs. Delamont apparently arrived at the Oban Rustic Cedar Homes, Inc., where she sold custom-built homes, but was gone when her first appointment came at 10 a.m., by Sunday afternoon, her co-workers became concerned and called authorities to report her disappearance. She hasn't touched her checking account, and she has always been very prompt at work in the past, said Detective Gary Harabin, who is investigating the case. According to everyone who knew her, it is very unlikely for her to disappear when she was supposed to be at work on Saturday and Sunday. Mrs. Delamon has worked as a saleswoman for Oban Rust Homes for about four months. According to Deputy Jim Brown, she was last seen about 6 p.m. Friday. She had talked on the telephone to her husband, Bob Delamon, from whom she is separated, about 8.30 p.m. Friday. Harbin said there is no indications that Mrs. Delamon ever got inside her office Saturday after she apparently arrived at work. From the pages of the September 16, 1981 issue of the Orlando Sentinel, title, Brother-in-law arrest too in land fraud scheme. The Seminole couple was to close the purchase of a 10-acre vacation site by the Withalacoochee River over coffee and donuts Sunday morning. 
the seller arrived at the couple's home with a notary public at his side and the necessary sales documents in his hand. Sitting on the sidelines was the husband's brother-in-law, visiting from Maryland, who watched the transaction from a fold-out bed, clad in a pajama top and blue jeans. Things were not as they appeared. The brother-in-law from Maryland was actually a Pinellas County Sheriff's detective, Wally McLaren, who arrested and charged the seller with using phony documents to sell land he didn't own. The seller's female companion, allegedly posed as a notary public, was also charged with using phony documents in the sale. James Delano Winkles, 40, was charged with one count each of uttering and forging a document on two counts of grand theft. Winkles used the fake name Gary. He approached a couple who owns a local auto dealership to sell them a gun last April. At the time, Winkles casually mentioned how he was buying some land on the Withalacoochee River. The couple told Winkles they were interested in buying land there. Two weeks later, Winkles returned and said he was buying a 61-acre parcel in Citrus County for 30 grand. In May, Winkles showed the couple a forged contract for the land, and later that month, offered to sell them 10 acres for 10 grand. The land was actually owned jointly by 19 heirs of a Savannah, Georgia man. Over the next 13 months, Winkles took a car and some automobile parts, along with 1200 in cash, as advance payments for the property and two wells he agreed to install there. In July, Winkles threw a camping party on the property, inviting the couple and friends there and treating them to food and beer. Winkles planted several stakes and printed with his name around the vacant land. Last Saturday, Winkles was to take a $2,000 down payment from the couple and close the sale, but the couple alerted by a suspicious relative had notified police. McLaren, after checking property records and determining that Winkles did not own the land, posed as a brother-in-law while a uniformed detective waited in another room. James Winkles did a lot of moving around before his family settled in Florida. They visited James's aunt, Aureen and Pearl, and their husbands, Bob and Tinker, in Hawaii, Rhode Island, and various military bases. In each place, Pearl would attach herself to several guards. If her husband was out of town and the guards were not available, Pearl would turn to James and sexually abuse him. During that time, James had a good friend, Gary. James told his grandmother, Lena, that he almost told Gary what was happening at the house. This prompted Lena to call him over to the sink, where she was cutting up a chicken, and to slice the knuckle on his finger, telling him to never tell anyone about what happened at their house. James was knocked unconscious five times in high school during athletic activities. He had been hospitalized as a teen with a high fever and had suffered from malaria. He joined the Air Force when he was 15 because his grandmother wanted him out of the house. He contracted hepatitis after about six weeks and the authorities discovered his true age and discharged him. James was in prison soon after on theft charges. In 1961, he was married for the first of three times. James often worked as a mechanic and was in and out of prison. He was severely beaten at least three times in prison and gassed to unconsciousness. He would eventually be prescribed medications for congestive heart failure, upset stomach, heart disease, and vascular diseases. He suffered many strokes and had episodes of Bell's palsy, as well as disc problems in his back. One day, a criminal psychologist, Dr. D, would note that, quote, It's characteristic of Winkles to say things deliberately designed to shock me, and I can't identify the motivation for such behavior. However, I feel that James' accounts of the sexual abuse he suffered as a child rang true. I did not find any evidence to support any statutory mitigating factor, and feel the most significant non-statutory factor that could be present is James' history of sexual abuse. James once told Dr. D that the way he was raised shaped his opinions on women, that he considered all women to be his potential target. A detective came and knocked on the door, and I said, is it Renee? And he just gave me that solemn look. It was the worst day ever. The Proof Podcast is back with a new case and a new season. 23 years ago, 18-year-old Renee Ramos went missing. 
Her body was later found in an empty Home Depot building on the edge of town. I don't think that they arrested the right people. It's about time somebody's trying to do something. She had a black eye about two weeks before she was murdered. They are involved. They definitely had her body and her backpack. You know people are going to judge you, right? Of course. They're judging me now. They've been judging me damn near my whole life. You can listen now to season two of Proof, wherever you get your podcasts. And follow along with us as we reinvestigate the murder at the warehouse. I have to ask... Did you kill Renee? American Criminal is a new true crime podcast from the studio behind American Scandal and American History Tellers. Every week, you'll fall deeper into the riveting stories of the country's most clever, craven, and cruel criminals. Fraud, theft, murder, and worse. Whatever the case, whoever the criminal, you don't know the whole story until now. The debut season tackles one of the most sensational cases of the 20th century, the Menendez murders. In 1989, young Lyle and Eric Menendez brutally shot their own parents. Prosecutors and the press said it was a multi-million dollar inheritance that led two greedy rich kids to murder. But the picture-perfect facade this Hollywood family built hid troubling abuse. Could these teenagers have been driven to kill? Or was it even in self-defense? Listen now. Go to AmericanCriminal.com or search for and follow American Criminal wherever you get your podcasts. Targets. From 1963 to 1982, Winkles moved around various counties all across Florida, amassing arrests for multiple felonies. He made a living by stealing and doing odd jobs, only occasionally taking up work as mechanic. Yet the police didn't recognize the true festering darkness inside him. From the archives of The Charlie Project, Barbara Jean Barkley, age 19 years old, height and weight, 5'4", 135 pounds, missing since 0529-1981, Caucasian female, dark brown hair, brown eyes, Barkley may spell her name Barbara, and her nickname is Bobby. Her hair was down to the middle of her back at the time of her disappearance, and feathered in the front. Barkley was last seen at her place of employment, the Pipe Furniture Store, in the 9600 block of 66th Street in Pinellas Park, Florida. Her fiancé's family owned the store. A neighbor saw her arrive to start her shift at 10 a.m. She was working alone at the time of her disappearance. She usually called her mother every day during her lunch break, but that day she never called. Her older brother went to the store at 1.30 p.m., and she was gone. A television set was turned on, Barkley's cigarettes were on a desk, and her purse was also left behind. She was never heard from again. There was no indications of a struggle at the store, but a calculator and a pencil was on the floor. Barkley's brother reported her missing at 7 p.m., when she didn't return to the home they shared, Barclay's beige four-door 1973 Plymouth Fury disappeared with her. The vehicle had a brown vinyl top, the Florida license plate number JZT-780, and a sticker on the right side of the back bumper reading, Single and Loving It. A few days later, the car was found abandoned in a parking lot outside Studio 19, a rock club at the southwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 and State Road 60 in Clearwater, Florida. The driver's side window was open, and the keys were in the ignition. Some of Barkley's belongings were inside the vehicle, which was low on gas. A photo of the car is posted with the case summary. A witness reported seeing a man driving Barkley's car at a self-serve car wash on U.S. 19 in Port Ritchie, Florida after her disappearance. He was cleaning the car. A sketch of the suspect is posted with the case summary. He is described as a Caucasian with dark blonde hair and a few days growth of a light colored facial hair. One of his legs was wrapped in a bandage and the man offered the witness money to wash his car for him, saying his injury made it hard for him to do it himself. A possible suspect is serial killer James Winkles. Barkley was very close to her mother at the time of her disappearance. Her mother has kept the same phone number since 1981, 
in case her daughter tries to get in touch with her. Foul play is suspected in Barkley's disappearance. She is presumed deceased. From the pages of the July 17, 1998 issue of the Tampa Bay Times. Title, Old Suspect is New Focus and Disappearances. Quote, First Cynthia Clements disappeared. Eight days later, Elizabeth Graham was gone. Months later, Bobby Barkley and Margot Delamon were missing. In 1980 and 1981, these are just four Pinellas County women who never knew each other, and they became inextricably linked by their fates. Two were found murdered. Two others have never been found. Eighteen years later, sheriff's detectives with new information have focused on James Delano Winkles, a convicted kidnapper who has been in prison since shortly after the last woman disappeared. Winkles, age 57, has been held at the Pinellas County Jail since he was transferred from a state prison in Hardy County on March 30th. Since then, records show sheriff's homicide detectives have taken him out, show and tell trips to undisclosed destinations four times. Sheriff Everett Rice would not confirm or deny Thursday that detectives have been digging at various places, either shown to them or described by Winkles, who has not been charged in any of the murders or disappearances. He was brought back here because he's a suspect in those four cases. He was a suspect then, and he's a suspect now, Rice said. He's here because we have new interest in an old suspect. The sheriff declined to elaborate on what new information or development detectives are investigating. Winkles was a suspect during the original investigation of the women's disappearances. Winkles once lived in Pinellas Park, worked as a mechanic, and operated a lawn maintenance service. He listed a Clearwater address when he was booked at the jail, but he has been in state prison for the past 17 years. He is serving a sentence of life plus 90 years for a crime that had similarities to one of the Pinellas cases. James Winkles married three times. His third marriage was to a woman named Mary Thomas. She gave birth to a child sometime in the mid-1970s. I won't mention the child's name here. The pair would remain married until James Winkles was charged for the murders of two missing women. In 1981, Winkles was arrested in Pinellas County. He was charged with fraud for selling forged documents, but was released from custody after posting bail. A month later, the decapitated body of a woman was found on a property in Citrus County, and while the coroner was unable to establish the cause of death, he put the victim's date of death as sometime between late September or early October. Winkles became a suspect after an anonymous witness contacted the authorities and claimed that they had seen Winkles' wife on the property. While Winkles admitted that they had camped out there in early October, he claimed that he was unaware of the body. His testimony was corroborated by his wife, and since there was insufficient evidence to charge them, the pair were released. Using one of his many aliases, Winkles arranged in January 1982 to meet with Donna Maltby, 28, a woman who worked for a Sanford Realty Company. He told her he wanted to look at some property near Interstate 4. After she got into his car, he pulled a knife and pushed it against her side. He tied her up, took $111 from her, and drove around the Orlando area for a while. When Winkles stopped for gas, Maltby ran from the car, screaming. Orange County deputies found him hiding nearby, behind a building. The Seminole County judge who sentenced Winkles for robbery, kidnapping, and grand theft said he wanted to keep him in prison for as long as possible. Margot Delamont, 39, one of the women who disappeared 18 years ago, was a Clearwater real estate saleswoman. She vanished October 2, 1981, after leaving her office in Pinellas Park and depositing her paycheck. Her headless body was found 19 days later in Citrus County. Her head was discovered seven months later in Hernando County. At that time... Former Pinellas Sheriff Jerry Coleman said the same person, in all probability, was responsible for the deaths or disappearances of Delamon, Graham, Clemens, Barkley, and many more women. A deeply religious, quiet woman, Clemens, the 19-year-old clerk, vanished on Labor Day, 1980, while working at a convenience store on 54th Avenue, near Kenneth City. Her purse was left behind and nothing was taken from the unlocked store. 
Six weeks later, her remains were found about four miles off Brian Derry Road, near Belcher Road. Wire was wrapped around her neck, and her mouth was taped. A dog groomer, Graham was last seen September 9th, 1980, driving a pampered poodle van to a house off Roosevelt Boulevard. A man had described Graham, 19, and asked specifically for her to come to the house. Detectives found the grooming van at the deserted house. Missing from the van were Graham's purse and a small choke chain with a leash. Graham has never been located. I drove myself crazy, said Gary Muchmore, who was Graham's boyfriend. I finally had to try and let it go. Something you learn to live with, but it never goes away. Muchmore said investigators repeatedly visited him over the years to ask, among other things, if he remembered what color underwear his girlfriend was wearing the day she disappeared. That was an interesting request. What color underwear? Like Graham, Barkley was never found. On May 29, 1981, the 19-year-old St. Petersburg woman opened the Pinellas Park Furniture Store where she worked and turned on the television. Several hours later, her brother found the unlocked store deserted and the television on. Listener, what I'm about to read comes directly from the pages of court documents and autopsy reports. If you are easily disturbed by graphic depictions of sexual crimes against women, then I suggest turning this episode off. You won't hurt my feelings. All right, are you still there? Let's get on with it. On September 9, 1980, having identified an employee of a dog grooming business as his victim, James Winkles arranged as a ruse for a groomer to come to a vacant house. Listener, you'll remember that house as the house at 2125 Bradford Street in the High Point area outside Largo. The house had been vacant for six months and mentioned in an old Tampa Bay Times newspaper article clipping. But then a different groomer arrived, the 19-year-old Elizabeth Graham. James was still aroused by the new girl. Remember, by this point, to James, all women were the targets. He chose to go through with his plan. James abducted Elizabeth at gunpoint. He handcuffed, gagged, and blindfolded her. Then he put her in his vehicle. He drove Graham to his grandmother's house, where he instilled fear in her by handcuffing her hands and feet, and then firing several 25 caliber rounds into the floor. Now that the girl was paralyzed with fear, James raped Elizabeth repeatedly over the course of four excruciating days. During that period, he made Elizabeth model for him in various underwear and women's lingerie. Finally, after he realized that she knew her location, James had let Elizabeth read his grandmother's magazines. He decided he had to kill her. James drugged Elizabeth, and when she fell asleep, he opened an umbrella over her head. James pointed the gun at the sleeping woman, held for a moment, and then fired three rounds into her head, and the umbrella was there to catch the spraying blood. Winkles burned her clothes and then buried her. But then James returned two weeks later. However, fearing someone would discover and identify the body, he cut her head off and took it to the Steinheitchee River in Lafayette County, where he removed the teeth and the lower mandible. He then did his best to scalp and skin the flesh from Elizabeth's skull. Once the head was sufficiently skinned, Winkles ran water through the skull to be sure no spent bullets remained inside and threw what remained of Elizabeth's head into the river. The skull was discovered in July 1981 and subsequent DNA testing revealed the skull to be Elizabeth Graham's. For many years, her murder remained unsolved. About a year later, in October 1981, James Winkles chose Margot Delamont for abduction when he visited a model home where Delamont was the realtor. He asked her out for a drink, which she refused. The next day, however, he arrived at the model home early and asked Delamont out to breakfast. She agreed. Afterwards, Margot agreed to see some property with James. He instead abducted her handcuffing her and taking her to a vacant house next door to his grandmother's. As in the earlier case, he raped the victim repeatedly over the next several days. On the morning of the fourth day, he realized he had to kill her 
because she can identify him in the house. He killed her with an overdose of sleeping pills, force feeding her 17 pills, then burned her clothes and buried her in Pinellas County. About two weeks later, he moved the body to Citrus County. A week after that, he dug up her head, removed the teeth, and deposited the skull in Hernando County, near an area where his family camped. The murders of Graham and Delamon remained unsolved until 1998, when James Winkles, who had been a suspect in the cases, then serving a prison sentence, contacted authorities claiming to have information, stating that he was having nightmares about the murders. Over the ensuing months, he confessed in detail to kidnapping and murdering the two women. He also provided specific information about the women's personal lives and the location and condition of the victim's remains. He took detectives to the exact location where Delamont's body had been found. Winkles also gave several detailed videotaped interviews about the murders to local news channels. Finally, on March 25, 1999... James Winkles was indicted for the premeditated murders of both women. Winkles filed a pretrial motion contending that Florida's capital sentence statute was unconstitutional. The court denied that motion, preserving the issue for appeal. Winkles pled guilty to the murder charges and waived his right to a jury for the penalty phase of the trial. At the plea hearing, the state was prepared to prove he committed the crimes through Winkles' confession and other corroborating evidence including testimony by Donna Malpe, who he kidnapped in 1982, but who managed to escape. He was serving a life sentence for this crime when he confessed to the Graham and Delamont murders. The evidence would have shown that the appellant always planned his abductions by identifying a victim, preparing his vehicle by disabling the passenger side door so that a passenger could not open the door or lower the window, then having handy his abduction kit containing pre-cut lengths of rope, handcuffs, gags. These gags were fishing bobber corks covered in glass shards or containing razor blades. Think about that one, listener. Sleeping pills, bottles of liquors, and Vicks vapor rub to put under the nose to prevent his smelling decaying bodies. James also kept a case containing women's undergarments of all sizes. That way James could make the women play dress up for him in various states of undress, with various types of women's undergarments to fulfill his sexual fantasies. The used underwear was saved after the women were dead, kept as a trophy. James liked to smell the crotch of these old used panties, hoping the smell would rekindle old memories of time spent with the victims he raped. During the conversation with representatives of the prosecutor's office, before the trial, Winkles offered a deal in which he would plead guilty to the crimes in exchange for not receiving the death penalty, but this was denied. Following the penalty phase as to which James Winkles waived his rights to a jury, the trial court sentenced James to death on both counts. Epilogue Ghosts in the Print Unfurling this spider's nest is revealing a black pitch shadow cast by James Winkles, over Pinellas County, and any young woman left alone in his stomping ground from the mid-70s to the mid-80s lived in a quiet sort of danger, a starless and moonless night where the daughters of the working class were taken to the home of James Winkle's grandmother. I hope the relevance doesn't escape you, listener. He took these scared girls to the home of the woman who abused him all those years ago and he inflicted on his victims the trauma he faced as a still-innocent child. Carrying with him his well-packed rape kit that included lingerie, so James could project his desires on women who couldn't simply say no. And when he was done with his victims, he always gave himself an excuse for why he had to kill them. That despite the ball gag with the razors and shards of glass. They were a real estate agent, so they could recognize homes and the way they were built. Or they read a magazine that had the address plastered on the cover. Whatever the reason, he used this excuse to shoot, strangle, drug, and maim these women to death. After they were decapitated, teeth removed and scattered, scalped, their skulls bleached white in the river, and bodies buried, it was on to the next, and the next after that. These daughters were plucked from the street, or from a bar, 
or a convenience store, or even tricked into falling directly into his web, enough so to affect the local population. When one of these girls escaped his grasp and he was serving life in prison, we figured, why not? Why not finally admit to what I've done? Get a few final moments in the sun, the spotlight, some media interviews to shake things up. They'd give him a deal, right? Not sentence him to death. And in his recollections of the two bodies, James Winkles gave the police. He boasted and smiled with pride. But then it became clear that he wouldn't get his deal. And he shut his mouth. The bodies were now bargaining chips. The prosecution wouldn't budge. And James Winkles was sentenced to death. The appeals were built over an alleged handshake agreement that the confessions he gave were exchanged with the understanding that he would not be given the death penalty. Winkles, a man who was never too bright, didn't make this agreement through official channels. James Winkles is tied to at least 62 missing and murdered people. He admitted to at least 26 of those women. To quote him directly, I got away with this stuff for so long. Things I've done make Ted Bundy look like a choir boy. It was the two women he confessed to killing that gave him the nightmares, James later admitted. In his final years, the stress of the death penalty began to eat at him. He was diagnosed with high blood pressure. I like to imagine those night terrors began to pile up, the echoes reverberating from the screams of the women whose voice he stole. Night after night, waking up in a cold sweat and remembering that death is just around the corner. James Winkles died from cardiac arrest on September 9th, 2010, while awaiting his sentence. Listener, I like to check obituaries for those I cover on the show. James Winkles has one message that's left on his obituary page, left by someone named Cheryl Mann on June 29th, 2023. It simply reads... The devil has your soul, no doubt. James Delano Winkles was 69 years old when he died. No one, friend, family, or ex-wife, claimed his body. He was buried in the prison cemetery to rot with the other discarded corpses. A fitting end. Who would ever think you would wake up in the morning and you would get a phone call that something happened to your daughter? 35 years later, Nancy Keough of Pinellas Park still wonders and grieves over the abduction and murder of her daughter, Cindy. So she had a lot of plans and a lot going on at that time. And um... As a new employee at a Pinellas Park convenience store, 19-year-old Cynthia Clemens was working the overnight shift alone. Pinellas County detectives believe that on Labor Day in 1980, she was forced into a car and driven away. Nothing, no evidence at the store. No indication of any struggle. Her purse was still left behind. When Cynthia's decomposed and apparently strangled body was found six weeks later in the woods off Brian Derry Road, there was still no suspect. Today, her murder remains one of 39 cold cases for the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. These cases that I bring home with me, and I sit for hours in the middle of the night, I read these cases. And Detective I Mike Bailey believes something. the brazen yet apparently calculated abduction of Cynthia Clements suggests the work of a serial killer. I have a feeling they're probably a little bit more common than what people realize. Florida has its notorious roster of serial psychopaths. Danny Rollins, Eileen Warnos, even Ted Bundy did his vicious work in Florida. But an in-depth Scripps Howard investigation found the Bay Area has clusters of unsolved murders that could also be the work of serial killers. Single mother Linda Slayton was found strangled in her Lakeland home in 1981. In 1982, the body of 16-year-old Leandra Hogan was found in a wooded lot off West Hillsboro Avenue. And there are others. It's difficult for local law enforcement to link their cold case murders to possible serial killers because they can't always see the big picture. Crime analysts say that serial killers often move from state to state, leaving behind bodies, but no witnesses. We don't look at every homicide. We just look at the random, motiveless homicides. Those are that are most likely to be serial. Special Agent assault. Michael Harrigan heads up the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. VICAP, as it's known, maintains a database of serial killers and crimes they make available to local agencies. VICAP also tracks the victims of serial killers, 70% of whom are women, who are usually sexually assaulted. With others, with, with true sexual homicides, the 
the sexual component is in the actual murder. Sexual assault was suspected in Cynthia Clemens' 1980 murder, and a known serial killer, James Winkles, admitted to the abduction murder of another 19-year-old girl. In that time frame when they took our Cindy, um, there was a lot of girls that came up missing and murdered, and it just seemed like it kept happening. Detective Bailey says Winkles, who died in prison, is just one of several suspects. But even if the case was solved today, Nancy Keough says her life as she knew it is gone forever. It destroyed us. He might as well killed all of us because it destroyed us. Detective Bailey is using the FBI's VICAP database, and he's optimistic that there will be a break in the murder of Cynthia Clemens even after 35 years.